different, different issues, issues and concerns. And concerns. I'm finding so, so many, many different, different mentalities. Cool resources. You know, I used to go to detention. Mm -hmm. Now, I've got to go to the mm -hmm. mm -hmm. jail. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to jail, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. go to jail. If, if I were a kid, I mean, you know, and, and at every stage, the, the alliance between prosecutors and judges, the, the nature of prison itself, I mean, it's all a punishment system. Yeah. It, so, um, yes, a thousand times, you know, and, and I think that we're conscious of that, you know, and, and because we have such, such a punitive paradigm, right, we're also in a space where we've criminalized mental health. Right. We've criminalized homelessness. I mean, I, I worked in I worked in direct services for three and a half years. I can tell you how many clients I had with two hundred fifty dollars fines where they fell asleep on a park bench. Newsflash: I'm sleeping on a park bench. You're not getting two fifty. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, even just how backwards that is, right? We, you know, we we you know we 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 perpetually criminalize people. You know, we say, hey, like, you know, you, you like, hey, you did your time. But then in society, we remind them every sense, you know, these invisible fences. You know, I was on parole for five years, you know, where I literally couldn't fraternize with anyone who has a felony. But what happens when the entire family has a felony? What do I do about it? Right? Um, so, 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 yeah, and I think that the answer, the answer is not necessarily, I'll say the answer to the end, because I think, I think it, the, I think that what you bring it up is a question more of values and not necessarily of what policy. I think that, I think that once the culture changes, policies are followed in a lot of different ways. And you know, uh, one of the fascinating things that I saw with a lot of recent changes around same-sex marriage is that you saw this cultural change shift a whole lot earlier on. You see it in the TV or some TV shows. You know, so on and so forth. You do see like that cultural shift before you actually saw the, the, the policies pass. Not that there wasn't any struggle, but when you look at throughout history, you see a number of different things. At least in movements throughout the last hundred years, you see people who were directly impacted leading that movement, saying, "Hey, I know what this looks like, and I know what schools where he may harm kids, or can I pass the same policy, um, you know, for someone's granddaughter?" One and the same, but we give ourselves permission if it's an ex-carnal comment, but not if it's somebody's son, father, or, or mother. Uh, nowhere else do we see the com commodification of, of, of convicted people, um, you know, in, of course, private prisons, right? And, 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 I, and I did put this note up there, right? No involuntary servitude except for what? Anyone recognize that? Can I get a hand somewhere? 13 what? Amendment. I got some veterans in here, and you're going to say it, <laughs> right? But then, yeah, right? So we, we, we technically outlawed slavery in this country, except for that fine print. You know, it's like that fine print. It's like getting a free trial, and you don't turn it off. You're like, wow, I didn't know that it was going to charge me all this money months later. And here it is, you know, here it is all these years we thought it is, that slavery was outlawed, or in, not slavery, sorry, involuntary servitude, right? Choose your language. Um, uh, except for those who've been convicted of a crime, right? And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, you know? Um, uh, but that does stick out for me a lot, a whole lot. Because I'm also a person who worked for 15 cents an hour with no sick pay, no vacation time, no rollover days, no bereavement days, none of that. In fact, if you refuse program in prison, you can get put in solitary. And I don't know, if, that, if that's not involuntary servitude, I don't know what, what is. Right? And if you want even further with that, uh, there's a great movie on Netflix, uh, which I'm sure many of you heard, um, uh, 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 13th, which actually kind of outlines how the system has actually morphed and changed and evolved. You know, I mean, it challenges us to think, you know, um, you know, do we need a better system, you know, or do we even need one at all? And how are other societies holding folks accountable without these same kind of uh, 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 settings? And of course, um, I love to read, so I came across of course, Brian Stevenson, which kind of, he, he, he really fleshed out some of this, and this is a quote that I actually have um, on my desk that I think about, but whenever society begins to create policies and laws rooted in fear and anger, there will be abuse and injustice. That is so deep on so many different levels. Um, and I want you guys to check out um, 
because nowhere else do you see fear. I mean, you hear fear, right? You fear, you hear anger, you know, some of the rhetoric. Um, and some of us get very passionate about the things that we care about, um, but not many of us get passionate about it to the, at the expense of others. Um, so um, you can easily Google this video, just Google prison auction. Um, and some of it is shocking, right? I want you to guess what it is that they're talking about. I don't think I heard. What did he say? It's starting to benefit me. How can you guarantee that regardless of what happens in this country, we will have a steady supply of product? His language, not mine, right? We talked about the human the language, right? Because there's, I mean, there's a lot of things I can do to a product that I can't do to Ron, <laughs> you know? Um, but more importantly, right, let me get the dehumanization part. That's the obvious part. But how can you guarantee a potential customer or investor an endless supply of product through that pipeline? And it's not a coincidence that, you know, a day after um, uh, uh, the current president was elected, that private stock skyrocketed 500%. So if you had a dollar, the day after Trump was elected, that dollar was worth 500. Mm -hmm. And that's very attractive for a lot of folks. Even at the expense of battling someone's humanity, or even in some cases, right, we're talking about values of contradicting our own values. And how do we balance that? How do we balance compassion and justice with, hey, give me a dollar now, I'll give you 500 dollars later. Or like I mentioned, the other one, humanity with capitalism. I do know a lot of the answers, um, but, I, but what I do know, <laughs> I like to take a lot of something. Um, and, I, and I think about uh, this young person in, in Indiana, so that's Indiana, uh, uh, and he said, you're the first black person I met in real life. You know, and he gave me a hug, and, and, and I like, you know, and, and, and when somebody comes to me, I tell you, you know, after being the problem of human contact for a long time, I feel it in my toes. And this young kid was actually like happy, you know, and, and I felt his happiness, you know? But that, that comment resonated with me the entire ride home because I'm like, damn, you know, you're 15 years old and this is the first time that you meet a person of color, a black person, in, in, in person, you know? And then I also thought, and then I draw these parallels, random parallels, with how many correction officers that I meet in the state who had never come in contact with a person of color outside of a correctional setting. Mm -hmm. And what impact did that have in our relations and interacting with each other? No wonder you can't give me an extra tray. No wonder you may fear me if all the information you have from me is based on whatever you get on the screen. Mm -hmm. In fact, you should fear me. You know? I always think about the time I was flying from Cali to New York where I live at, um, and the woman actually grabbed her purse while I was in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. 30,000 feet there. <laughs> like, what am I going to do? Right? Am I going to just grab your purse and like skydive into whatever? Right? But this, but, this, but this visceral kind of response, without truly even knowing who I am or anything about me except anything that you can tell from just like looking at me. And I travel just like any other person. Sweatpants, t-shirt, you put the thing on, it's, it's a long ride, you know? Um, so, so that resonated with me and, and I don't know if it was immediate, but part of the work that I'm doing now, you know, um, at, at the National Religious Campaign Against Torture, is that I'm convinced, just like Brian Stevenson is convinced, that by, because it wasn't until me and Officer Stevens got to really know each other and talking, that he felt free to me, free to, to actually engage me. So much so, you know, that he ended up giving me extra trays, uh, and that's a big thing in person. You got an extra trade. You're you're like the man or the woman. You're the girl. You know. Um, and had that conversation. So so how can we expose more people to that young kid in rural Indiana who said this is the first time I've ever met a, a black person in, in person in real life? You know. Um, and, but more importantly, how do we how do we 
you know, build the capacity of those folks who have been solitary survivors so they have the courage, so they walk the way, you know, I'm trying to make sense of the harm that's also been done to them um, in a way in which will educate others. And that's not an easy feat. You know, um, now I'm truly convinced that, you know, human, humanizing solitary survivors, uh, you know, and, and building the capacity to lead, of course, and also giving them the sense of control over their own narratives. And now Visa, who is uh, one of our um, solitary survivors, fully incarcerated leaders, she is, she is amazing out of New Jersey, you know, um, she saw that being transferred into other areas of her life. So her ability to walk inside of a legislative office and say, hey, you know, I, I was a woman who, and, and like you can straight Google her and or her story, but I'm a, I'm a woman who was held in solitary while I was expecting, who was strip searched every day and a lot of these other things, and how that confidence transferred into job interviews and saying, hey, no, this is the salary that I deserve, or being able to communicate in this personal life or with friends. You know, um, and it's funny because by sharing my story or, or people sharing their stories, we give the listener the opportunity to, to, to practice empathy. And I believe that one of, the, one of the characteristics which truly makes us human is the ability to place in ourselves in other people's shoes and feel what they feel and see what they see and hurt the way that they hurt, but also be happy like the way that they're happy. You know, um, you know emotions are contagious. You know, um, so, so are perceptions. Um, and I can't tell you how many times I've had talks in afterwards, you know, that mother, who I probably stereotype, right? Because it's not just one way I stereotype, we all do. Um, and she's like, hey, like, my son just went through the exact same thing. And I have to step back and like, not you, you know? Um, uh, but yes, you, right? Because with 2.3 million people who are incarcerated in this country, about, about another 100,000 people, you know, in solitary, about another 70 million people with a criminal record on file, Right, or another 15 million people on probation or parole, chances are we're more alike and impacted by a lot of these issues than, 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 than we may think. You know, I would even, I would even argue that uh, most of us in this room, you know, um, either uh, have been touched by the system, impacted by the system, or have family members impacted by the system because it's so insidious. And I want to open up for questions in a minute. Um, uh, you know, um, sharing those narratives by amplifying their voices and creating opportunities you know, for solitary survivors to share their experiences. Um, and this is Felix Cologne during Solitary Week. And if you don't know Felix, you're, you, you'll probably be afraid of him. Um, he's rough on the edges, he talks really strong, you know, but if you get to know him, he's like the biggest teddy bear. You know, and, and you're actually safer with him than not with him. Because he's the guy who's gonna jump in front of a knife because he's so fearless in a sense. Um, but he also has his own values that he abides by. You know, um, and here it is, he's engaging these young students. Actually, two of them were uh, 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 future FBI agents. And in this case, I took the picture of Felix to say, uh, why, you, why would you want to arrest your own people? Um, and, and I remember that. Um, moving forward. Uh, we also, um, so in addition to building the capacity of solitary survivors, right, training them to not only tell their stories, but also teaching them about the legislative process, you know, teaching them the politics of politics, <laughs> you know, um, uh, but more importantly, you know, campaign work, community organizing, a lot of things that we're not necessarily naturally inclined to coming out of prison, you know, um, you know, in addition to that, also sharing their narratives and sharing their stories using, you know, technology, we have a virtual reality, and I'll tell you something about the virtual reality, is that, if you've never been inside of a cell, we try to bring the cell to you. So you can actually see, have this immersive experience um, uh, with solitude. It's very, very engaging in the sense that we've been able to actually mobilize and take these small digital cells, if you will, um, uh, literally across the country to bring the cells to people, to bring the cell to like that young kid who, who probably hasn't even never even seen a cell before or anything like that. Recognize that picture, Sean? <laughs> um, but it's not just working with folks who've been impacted and, 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 and uh, you know, and, and their communities. It's also working with the other, with the other side. It's also working with corrections. You know, um, and uh, I actually highlighted a quote by Rick Ramis, who um, is one of the correctional leaders that I, I respect in this space. Um, he said, can you imagine spending years without 
uh, yeah, without having regular social interaction or without full access to human, the basic human activities like showering and exercising. Some boxes you get two showers a day, other weeks, some you get three showers a week. Um, you know, when did it become okay, right? It, it sounds like a value question there, right? Uh, to lock up someone who is severely mentally ill and let the demons chase him around, around in the cell. What is wrong with us, I asked. And this he did after he spent time in solitary himself. He put himself in solitary for a day because he said, well, what are the advocates complaining about? This can't be that bad. He then finished the entire day. He walks out of his cell saying, we need to release people out of here. And literally walked to every person's cell and said, when was the last person this person received a misbehavior? When was the last time this person received a misbehavior report? If it was more than six months ago, let them out. The concern was that fear of narrative, right? But well, they're going to kill everyone. What are they going to do? He said, well, if they break the rules, we can always put them back. It's our jail. I don't necessarily agree with that line of thinking, but hey, <laughs> got them out, right? And now Colorado leads the country in the least number of people that are incarcerated nice. and in solitary. Because a correctional leader decided to go against the grain of maybe his own staff, maybe, maybe popular opinion, and say, we don't need to have this. And lo and behold, we didn't see an increase in violence happen at all. You know, um, uh, so it means collaborating with correctional officials. And in that sense, you know, um, uh, along, with, uh, along with Rick Ramis and Craig Haney who's there and others, um, I myself, and, and, and I represent NearCat on the, um, uh, 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 the Safe Alternative Se Safe Segregation initiative out of the Vera Institute of Justice. And it's basically an initiative that connects correctional uh, uh, officials with uh, advocates and tries to find some middle ground around the torture of it. You know, um, there's a lot, a few other layers there, um, uh, a lot of politics. Um, uh, but it's, 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 such a, it's such a cross collaborative um, group of folks that, you know, if there's a conversation that needs to be had in Nevada or something like that. You know, I feel comfortable reaching out to the commissioner in Nevada based on the documentation to say, hey, can we have this conversation, so on and so forth, to try to bridge the gap between the advocates and correctional staff, which don't always get along because it kind of seems like they're natural enemies, but they actually, they actually don't, they actually not. You know, when we look at the fact that correctional officers are also harmed by incarceration, how they have some of the highest alcohol, alcohol, alcoholism rates, highest divorce rates, I'll never forget seeing broken Hennessy bottles on the park on the CO parking lot of Rikers Island. Hey, that's none of my business, but it's there, <laughs> right? Um, and how is that impacting your, your decision making when you're trying to decide whether you should put me in solitary or not? Um, so, so no, we, we 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 both want the same thing, but the fear and the anger piece does get in the way because it's harm on both sides. Um, and a lot of that, a great example is California, and that also means working with faith leaders. You know, faith leaders, uh, like I told the, um, the majority leader a few hours ago, you know, um, are, are in a unique position to hold our legislators accountable to the, to, the, to, the, to the values that they say they stand for. You know, again, that, to create that cognitive dissonance. And one has to change the values of the action. And usually the actions change because values are hard to shape. They're kind of ingrained in us. Um, and I tell you, it's been, it's been really uh, a great working with faith leaders because one of the things that actually kept me going through the time in solitary, and you can imagine I get that question a lot, um, was just really hope. You know, the belief in things yet to be revealed, you know? Um, and the hope that I would get out, the hope that I would see my daughter, and so on and so forth. You know, um, which I still try to make sense of to this day. Okay. Oh. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, I know we're running short on time, and I really did want to leave a whole lot of space open for questions, uh, but it's really a little short. Um, but let's let's not waste time talking about how much time we don't have, and let's talk. <laughs> anyone anyone want to respond, react? Hand in the back there. Yeah, um, I liked what you said about the kind of tense and difficult relationship between advocates and correctional staff, mm -hmm. and that's kind of a balance, uh, a line that I balance in my work. We send tutors into support mm -hmm. educational classrooms in prisons, nice. and so we are all. 80 of us here in Philly are kind of on that line of complacency where we're working against the system but working inside of it. So I just wondering how you navigate that now as an advocate for somebody who goes back into the space that comes to Yeah, um, it's funny for me being an advocate and also being a fully incarcerated advocate going inside of space, right? Like sometimes I come in, you know, um, I'll have a, I'll look like a lawyer, <laughs> you know, um, and then get treated as such. And then when I start speaking, Right, it's hard for me to talk and not talk about the fact that I was away for 13 years of my life. Um, 
and you literally see the emotional chemistry in the room shift. <laughs> <laughs> you see that a lot, you know. Um, I've never been disrespected or anything like that, but I think the the the, the friction comes in when security, or for, for for matters of security, a policy is passed or an accident has happened that conflict that conflicts with with you as a person who's working in there. And social workers get this a lot. They do a loyalty piece, you know. Um, and, 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 and what I always tell people in those cases, I think that any time that you stand strong on the, side of, um, on the side of truth and honesty, where you believe in your heart to be right, you know, um, to stand by that. I think that a lot of the neglect that I saw throughout my incarceration wasn't, um, wasn't proactive. I mean, don't get it, I mean, you get your ribs broken. Um, but a lot, of the, a lot of the personal neglect that I saw was actually or a lot of the, the injustice, if you will, came as a result of neglect. You know, not looking at it. Bradley Ballard down like that. You know, uh, the crossroads, he kept walking by his cell, he kept yelling, I need insulin, I need insulin. He was like, oh, that guy's mentally ill, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. And finally, one officer went to the sergeant's rank and officer said, hey, I don't know, this guy in eight cells, he might look at him. He said, well, get out of here, don't come back here until there's a body. Two weeks later, Bradley Ballard died. Right? And now that sergeant's facing, you know, uh, you know, punitive consequences, but I always wonder what would happen if the soap, because you, if one of the social workers would have said, hey, we need to do something about this or speak up, you know, and, and it's not easy, it's really not, you know, it's, it's really not, you know, I yield my privilege as a person who comes in from the outside who, hey, you don't pay me, you know, um, so I'm not restricted by any of that, um, not that I am, <laughs> but so that, and then being, and then, and then also having my truth as a person who's been formerly incarcerated. I know you're not going to say that that's what y'all do because I know for a fact that's not what you do. In fact, I don't even want to talk to you. I'd rather talk to the, to the man or to the person who's inside of the cell to get the real truth from them. You know, um, and it's not an easy position. You have to challenge outwards and also challenge folks, you know, in, internally. And then you, this, then this, this going to be battles that you have to choose. You know, Mary Buser, who wrote the book Lockdown on Rikers, had to make that exact decision. Here she is, she is the chief uh, mental health officer in the unit, and she saw so much damage being done. And she said, I cannot with good conscience continue in this job. A cognitive dissonance, right? When the actions are so blatant that it conflicts with my, with my values, and yes, I need a paycheck just like anybody else, we have to take care of ourselves. But at what point do I say, you know what? I cannot participate in this at all. You know, I'm, I'm finding so many, so many Different mentality, different mentality that it seems hard. It, hard. it, hard. it, it seems, it seems challenging. challenging. I don't say hard because the only thing hard is the concrete that we 